For almost 400 years, the Siege of Angband in the First Age allowed for Beleriand to experience something of a Golden Age, where the Elves could truly appreciate and beautify their new lands, and where entire generations of men could live and die in peace. This all changed when the Siege was broken. But the question is, why didn't the Elves escalate the Siege and assault Angband first? Okay, first a bit of background. The Siege of Angband was an event that lasted 395 years. It began in the year 60 of the First Age, after Morgoth's forces were crushed at the Dagger Eglareb. The Elves realised that Morgoth would simply keep attacking unless something was done about it. So began the Siege of Angband, a military investment on the plains of Ard Galan that would ensure nothing would leave the gates of Angband undetected and unengaged. That being said, the Siege of Angband was not a perfect measure, nor was it solving the problem of Morgoth entirely. Most of Angband was underground, and either beneath or behind the mountain range known as Ered Engrin, the Iron Mountains. While the Elves could besiege Angband from the south, they could not entirely surround it, as the lands beyond the Ered Engrin were frozen wastelands. This meant that Morgoth could still send out his forces from Angband, but instead of heading south, they would instead have to go around the mountains. Thus, bands of orcs could still terrorise Beleriand, such as in 155 at Lamoth, or in 375 at the Battle of the Gelian Askar Stockade. Also, the fact that the Siege of Angband, unlike the Siege of Barad-dûr in the Second Age, was not a true siege, meant that Morgoth's forces were not gradually weakening and dwindling as the siege continued. Instead, Morgoth was hard at work replacing his forces and making them all the more deadly. The elves got a taste of this when Glarung, the father of dragons, temporarily broke the siege in 260 and was only defeated when Fingon led a force of horse archers against him. So while the Siege of Angband did allow for a long period of peace, it was very clearly a temporary measure. Morgoth's strength would continue to grow, and he would eventually launch a major assault against it. This day came in 455, the Dagger Bragalak, the Battle of Sudden Flame, where Morgoth launched a surprise assault against the besiegers, wiping them out and proceeding to devastate parts of Beleriand. With the siege broken, Morgoth could escalate the war, and a little over 50 years later, he seemed to have decisively won it. With all that being said, why didn't the Noldor attack first? Instead of simply besieging Angband, why didn't they launch a full-scale assault against it and attempt to defeat Morgoth that way? In this video, we'll go through some of the reasons, and then I want to talk about whether or not an attack would have actually succeeded. The first, and perhaps the greatest reason, is manpower. This is the greatest weakness of the Elves when it comes to war. According to Aegnor, the Noldor do not marry during times of war. Also, Elves rarely have more than four children, and usually have less, and an Elf takes 100 years to reach maturity. So during the Wars of the First Age, the Elves would have had very little population growth. Remember, several hundred years is a relatively short amount of time for Elves, so very few children would have been born, and many of those would not have reached adulthood. In fact, it wouldn't be a stretch to assume that the Elves probably struggled to replace losses sustained in earlier conflicts. For example, the Noldor lost people at the Kinslaying at Alcalonde, crossing the ocean and the Helcaraxe, at the Dagger Nuin Giliath, the Dagger Aglareb, and Morgoth's minor attempts to break the siege. Meanwhile, the Sindar and their allies suffered heavy casualties during the First Battle of Beleriand. While none of these events were catastrophic for the Elves, it should be said that these losses would add up, and replacing them alone wouldn't be so easy. So when it comes to an assault on Angband, it would be all or nothing for the Elves. If they fail and retreat with heavy casualties, they would not have the strength to try again for centuries at the minimum, and in that time, Morgoth's forces would undoubtedly surpass them. The problem of manpower was partially solved with the arrival of men, the Adain, into Beleriand in 310. In the time it would take for a single elf to reach maturity, there would be four to five generations of men. Their numbers could explode in a way that the elves could not replicate. However, when the Adain first arrived in Beleriand, they didn't number all that much. The House of Bayor numbered about 5,000, 
the House of Halef a little more, and the House of Hador was the largest at somewhere between 15 to 20,000. It would take generations for them to reach a point where they were truly capable of contributing to the war against Morgoth in a meaningful way, and by the time that point was reached in the mid-5th century, time was running out. The second reason is that there was a lack of willingness and unity. We know this because sometime in the 5th century, Fingolfin actually advocated for an assault upon Angband, only to be turned down by most of the Noldor. A common problem for the Elves and the Edain in their war against Morgoth was how politically fractured they were. Many of the Noldor actually detested each other. Although Fingolfin was High King, the title was basically honorary. He ruled over Hiflum and wielded a great deal of prestige, but most of the Noldoran princes were completely autonomous. The sons of Feanor in East Beleriand regarded Maedros as their ruler. The sons of Fenarfin, Angrod and Agnor were subject to King Finrod Felagund in Nargafront, and even Fingolfin's own son, Turgon, was his own independent ruler. So going back to Fingolfin's idea for assaulting Angband, it was immediately shot down by most of the princes of the Noldor, especially the sons of Feanor, who were quite content with the status quo. Firstly, they could safely ignore the oath of Feanor if the Silmarils were practically out of reach, and secondly, they recognised that win or lose, there would be enormous casualties with an attack on Angband. Fingolfin's only supporters in this matter were Angrod and Egnor, who recognised that their homeland in Dorthonion was most vulnerable to attack, but it should be said that Angrod and Egnor wielded very little power compared to their fellow princes. For most of the Noldor, Morgoth had become a problem that was out of sight, out of mind. So the Noldor were faced with two major problems, manpower and disunity. Manpower was a valid concern for much of the Siege of Angband, but it was soon partially solved by the arrival of men from the three houses of the Edain. I say partially because it did not change the fact that elves reproduced slowly and Morgoth's creatures reproduced quickly. But even with the manpower issues solved, the elves were still not united in effort and goal. For such an assault to ever have a chance of working, the Noldor and the Edain would have needed to unite under one banner, and that was simply something they were unable to do. There was too much bad blood between certain factions and individuals. Okay, but let's assume that, hypothetically, Fingolfin was able to unite the Noldor and get them to agree on an attack against Angband. Would it have been successful? The answer? No. Like, the worst no that you can possibly imagine. A catastrophic no. Unfortunately for Fingolfin, by the time the strength of the Noldor and the Edain had peaked shortly before the Dagor Bragalak, Morgoth's own forces had surpassed them, his orcs outnumbered them, and he now had dangerous new weapons known as dragons. When Fingolfin advocated for an assault upon Angband, he was going off the intelligence that was available to him, which is to say, not much at all. The thing about Angband is that most of it was underground, and most of its vast tunnels and caverns had never been seen by any elf, unless they were a prisoner or a slave. As a result, the true scope of Angband and the true size of Morgoth's forces was something that the elves were never really aware of, and Morgoth used this to great effect. After the Dagor Nuin Giliath and the Dagor Aglareb, Morgoth could use Angband to conceal how weak his forces had become, and later at the Neneath Arnoediad, Morgoth used Angband to conceal just how large his forces were. So, assuming an assault upon Angband was launched, Breaking into Angband itself wouldn't even be the most difficult part. After all, it was done twice, by Beren and Luthien, and again by Gwyndor and his company at the Nuneaf Arnoidiad. But Gwyndor's company is a great case study for what might happen to a large army. They burst through the gate, and even got as far as Morgoth's throne room, but were then cut off and destroyed. This is because once they were inside Angband, they were blind, and Morgoth used a network of hidden doors and tunnels to flood his forces onto the field, removing any chance of a rescue attempt. Any army entering Angband would face the same problem. They wouldn't know where they are truly going, they wouldn't know how many enemies await them, they wouldn't know if they were walking into a trap or an ambush, and they wouldn't even truly know whether they were winning or losing. The host of the Valar was able to avoid this during the War of Wrath by cheating and literally using divine power to unearth Angband. And as I said earlier, the Noldor could not simply retreat and decide to come back in 10 years and finish the job. If they sustained heavy losses, which they no doubt would, 
That would be the equivalent of losing the war. An attack on Angband would be an all or nothing assault. In reality, the window of opportunity for an assault upon Angband that might have been successful was very small, perhaps directly after the Dagor Nuin Giliath or the Dagor Aglareb. But after both of these occasions, the Noldor were still in the process of settling and building their realms. So, the Sons of Feanor shouldn't be criticised for their inaction, even if it was mostly due to selfish reasons. Although Fingolfin was wise to recognise that Morgoth could not be contained in Angband forever, he did not have the information available to recognise that his solution was just as bad, if not worse, than simply continuing the siege. And unfortunately for the Elves and the Adain, the siege of Angband would not be eternal. As I said earlier, in 455, the Battle of Sudden Flame saw the death of Fingolfin, Angrod and Egnor and their people were destroyed, as was most of the House of Beor. The Sons of Feanor were badly bloodied, and many of them were forced to abandon their lands. And after that, the war snowballed in Morgoth's favour. The Noldor and the Adain would make one last throw of the dice in the form of the Union of Maedros, but it was doomed from the start. The actions of Kelegorm and Curifin, and the bad blood between the Feanorians and Thingol, ensured that Nargothrond and Doriath, two of the most powerful remaining kingdoms, would not join the Union, meaning they had to supplement their manpower with Easterlings, many of whom ended up being traitors. And at the Nerneaf Arnoediad, the Union made their fateful attempt to reinstate the Siege of Angband, but they were crushed, and the war was essentially over. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. I think the worst thing about the First Age is that many people aren't as familiar with it as they are with the Third Age, which is a shame because the First Age stuff is truly amazing and in many ways even more thought out than the Third Age stuff. Anyway, it's all great. Cheers, farewell, and remember, unless you have the power of the Divine on your side, attacking Angband will result in an Angbang.